Look into my eyes. Your soul is stained by the blood of the innocent. Feel the pain. This issue starts two months ago in a psych ward in Queens, New York, with a man hunched over on his bed wearing a mask, thinking to himself, they are not afraid. They should be. At that moment, a doctor and two orderlies come in and take his mask, stating that they have no idea how he keeps getting these masks. The doctor tells him that this sort of behavior isn't helping his recovery. The man's name is Ebenezer. He ignores the doctor's words and his only thoughts on wondering what the doctor's insides are made of. I'm guessing this man skipped his biology and anatomy classes. The other two orderlies are mocking Ebenezer and telling the doctor he is wasting his time. Ebenezer starts wondering the same thing of the orderlies. He must know what their insides are made of. The doctor, defending his patient, scolds the orderlies for talking in such a way in front of the patient. They leave. And as they do, some crows come to the window with a knife and a new mask with some string. Ebenezer holds the knife with a haunting grin. We cut to the present day, and of course, Ebenezer Lawton, also known as Marvel's version of the Scarecrow, who had previously been taken down by Captain America, has escaped and left only bodies in his wake. Linda Wee reports on this and lets us know a bit more about him. He is a known contortionist. Slipping his cell, he disemboweled a doctor and two orderlies. Police are wondering if maybe the recent child abductions have been caused by Scarecrow and not Ghost Rider, as they originally thought. He recently killed someone in Brooklyn and hung him from a lamppost after disemboweling him and stuffing him with straw. Now that's fucked up. She ends the broadcast by saying police are stepping up their search for Scarecrow and to be careful out there. The Ghost Rider, after observing this broadcast, rides off with his next target in mind. He arrives in Cypress Hill Cemetery and undergoes that all too familiar transformation back into Daniel Ketch. Daniel Ketch has been through a lot in these past few months and the pain that has brought him. Pain from the transformation he must take in order to become Ghost Rider. Pain from the punishment the Ghost Rider inflicts on the guilty. Pain of his sister lying for months now in a coma that she can't seem to break free of. He is tormented by all this pain, and he doesn't see an escape from it. Later, we see Stacy trying at least to get Dan out of the house, to help get his mind off things. Dan, being the broody moody guy that he's slowly becoming, is resisting. But today, Stacy isn't having any of it. And I love her for that. And so does Dan's mom. She tells them to have fun and is really thankful towards Stacy for being so helpful. She says this is exactly what he needs. She's noticed a change in Dan since Stacy's accident. And now he hasn't gone to see Barb in weeks. And he's always on that mysterious motorcycle that no one seems to know where he got it from. Stacy is like, don't worry, he is in perfect hands. Now this part is a little awkward and uncalled for. Stacy asks Dan to hop in her car. He says he would rather take his bike. And she's like, there's no way I am getting on that. It's dangerous. You really should get rid of it. Dan flips the fuck out and is like, I am not getting rid of this bike for you, my mother, or anyone else. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> because no one wants to see the immediate aftermath of that, it cuts to them driving off in her car. Dan saying, if you don't want to ride it, fine, let's go. Elsewhere at the New York Medical Center, a maintenance worker is walking downstairs into a dark basement to change a light bulb that has gone out. The only light coming from his flashlight, he complains that they don't need to hire a union worker when he is perfectly capable of doing it himself. They don't need no specialists, until he wins the lottery, of course. Oh crap, now his flashlight is out. Wait. Where have we seen this before? Oh shit. Oh no. It's him. Blackout. He claims to be a specialist himself. And don't we know it. Back on Dan and Stacy's date, we see Dan apologizing. And I'm really glad this is shown. Otherwise, it would have bothered me. 
he was seriously out of line. He asks her for forgiveness, and she obliges. Also, she looks really pretty right here. I have a serious soft spot for Stacy, if you haven't noticed. She is just super awesome and has a lot of patience and understanding, which can be very tough to have dealing with Dan and Dan's understandably erratic behavior and random outbursts. I say it's understandable, but that doesn't make it inexcusable. He is dealing with a lot, shouldn't take it out on loved ones who care and are only trying to be there for him. Anyways, I'm rambling back to the story. She tells him he needs to learn to relax. He just compliments the food. She tells him his mom needs him and he should visit Barb with his mom soon. He again ignores this and just talks about how they should have come to this restaurant sooner. This understandably irritates her, telling him he needs to stop blaming himself for what happened to Barb and he needs to talk to her. He lies and says he isn't holding he isn't hiding anything from her. And just it all just feels so weird. Stacy insists that Dan has to talk to someone and let it all go. And he needs to go to see his sister. He hasn't seen her since issue three. She is more than his sister. She is his best friend. She says they should go see her tonight. He finally agrees. We cut to Scarecrow, thinking to himself while looking to the distance on a rooftop. He wonders where Captain America is. He asks why Cap hasn't come and stopped him, as he previously has. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Before my fearful trip is done. Stop me. Fear me. Fear what is inside me. Inside all of us. Fear what I must do. The fearful thing that must be released from everyone, old and new. So, Captain America, if you won't stop me tonight, another example must be made. He jumps down in front of a woman and her baby, and I myself fear what happens next. She screams for help. One hour later, Dan and Stacy stumble across the scene of the crime being barricaded off to onlookers by the police. Stacy is like, let's get a closer look. I'm like, yeah, sure, let's get traumatized because that's always fun. We see the outline of the mother and her baby stained with their blood. Stacy is surprised, of course, disturbed by all of this. She is like, what kind of sick fuck would do such a thing? Dan pleads to just leave, but the blood, the innocent blood, is the writer starting to rub off on him? He thinks he has to let all this ghostwriter stuff go and shouldn't buy into any of it. He overhears one of the cops. They have Scarecrow tracked to a two block area. At that moment, Across the way, he sees the bike has followed him there. Best boy! It scents the innocent blood. He feels the urge to be the ghostwriter again. We cut to Stacy. Dan? He feels Barb would understand. He feels Stacy would too if he told her everything. Ghostwriter is needed, and while I feel that is very much the case, part of me also wonders if Dan is just using this to run away from reality and his life. Is he using the writer as an escape? I mean, come on. The obvious answer has to be yes. Dan can't fight it anymore. He rides off. He also wonders if Scarecrow might be behind the kidnappings. But personally, I feel like the kidnapping isn't his style. He seems to just kill everyone he comes across. I could be wrong, though. Stacy sees Dan drive off, probably wondering how the hell he got his motorcycle there. <laughs> And also, where the hell is he going? He totally bailed on her. Meanwhile, at the hospital, a man in a trench coat roams the halls. A nurse wonders where the maintenance man has gone, as all the lights on the intensive care ward are out. I think we all know who is responsible. Darkness has always cloaked his body and his soul. It was always good. He walks uninterrupted past the nurse. Now darkness must cloak his once beautiful face. He is not happy about it. He creeps into Barbara's room. Barbara? But how? Does he know? What do you think of your brother's handiwork, Barbara? Elsewhere, Ghost Rider meets up with a police barricade is like, out of my way, fools. I mean you no harm. 
the spirit of vengeance will not be stopped. His inner monologue becomes very introspective. He has become more self-aware of his need for vengeance and to avenge the innocent, asking himself why, who is he, and why does he have this need? He doesn't seem to have the answers. Why was I made? Who made me? And what did they make me for? Only more questions and this need to act, so that's just what he'll do. On the rooftops we find Scarecrow. He seems to have a strong need for Captain America to bash him with his shield. And I am not here to kink shame, but the killing on the other hand, that needs to stop. And Ghost Rider agrees as he rides straight up the building, straight towards Scarecrow. Ghost Rider confronts him. You killing Rampage will be stopped now! Scarecrow isn't having it and sicks his crows on Ghosty. Ghosty just knocks the crows away. And I don't blame him. I've been pecked to death by crows, and it isn't fun. Again, he wonders why he says the same words over and over. You must suffer as you have made others suffer. You must feel their pain. As he says this, he drags him with his chain off the roof. He hopscotches roofs with Scarecrow in tow. They stop, Scarecrow frustrated as he states now Cap will never find him. He says this chain must be tight, but not tight enough. He slips through the chains. The rider grabs him. You must feel the pain of my penance, dear. Feel the pain of your... Victims? Scarecrow slips out of his grasp, telling him not tonight. He says to tonight all he can feel is the fearful thing inside him. He literally slips into the sewers and tells Ghosty that he will give him another chance if Captain America fails to stop him. Ghost Rider is pissed and having none of it. He friggin' tears off the curb to get to him, but he is already gone. Then he asks himself, what is this force that drives him? We cut to the hospital and Blackout is standing over Barbara. He says Dan has brought him to this. He and that abomination he becomes, stating that he is the master of shadows. He tells Barb that he followed Daniel to the cemetery and watched him change. He exclaims that while he may change into this creature, he gets to revert back to his pretty face. But Blackout? Blackout doesn't have that choice. He can never get his beautiful face back. He blames Ghost Rider and Dan for his misfortune. He wants payback. His life will become a reeking wound surrounding him. Everything that he loves, everyone will be taken from him beginning with you, dearest Barbara. That morning, Dan walks into his home. The phone rings. Dan answers to a sobbing voice telling him to come quick. At the hospital, Dan shouts, saying he should have been here. He apologizes to his mother, his mother embracing him. Captain Dolan, Stacy, and Jack all here. Dan is completely in shambles, saying he could have done something if only he was here. Stacy says there isn't anything he or anyone else could have done against this maniac. His mom agrees. Dan just bolts, saying he is going to do what he can. That night, Scarecrow looms over the rooftops of New York. He is disappointed Captain America hasn't come to stop him, so he must kill once more. At that moment, the Rider shows up, but Scarecrow shouts he wants Cap. Ghost Rider isn't having any of this. He punches Scarecrow in his crazy face. Ghost Rider feels more rage than he has felt in a long time. Scarecrow states he can't stop him without killing him. Captain America won't. It isn't his style. Ghosty says he won't kill him either. He explains this as he throws his pitchfork away. But Scarecrow will feel the pain. Scarecrow mocks him, questioning what could Ghost Rider possibly know of the fearful thing that gnaws away at him. Ghost Rider just responds that he must suffer by his penance stare. Shockingly, Scarecrow laments that if Ghost Rider or Captain America won't kill him, perhaps by his own hand, as he pushes away from the Rider and lands right on top of his own pitchfork. Ghost Rider was barely paying attention as he was lost in his thoughts on his own purpose. He sees this as justice, as vengeance, and he rides away. Minutes later, two mysterious men apprehend Scarecrow. Two days later, a funeral is held. It's for Barbara. 
Dan reflects on how both of them have been tied to the cemetery. And while Barbara's story may have come to an end, Dan's is just beginning. Something new has been released inside Ghostwriter, and Dan can sense it. He feels he is about to learn more about those spirit of vengeance, and about himself. Payback has just begun. From now on, whatever he does, it will be for Barbara. We close out with him saying goodbye, and that he loves her. If you couldn't tell already, this issue was very important for our characters. Let's start with the easy stuff to talk about. This is the first appearance of many for Scarecrow and Ghost Rider. Originally a Captain America villain, he seems to be better suited for this dark tone of Ghost Rider. This also marks the return of Blackout, and he goes from being just a rival of Ghost Rider's to being one of his most deadliest enemies, who made it really personal for both Dan Ketch and the writer. See, when a villain kills in a comic book, usually you're like, yeah, that's hardcore, yeah, that's that's pretty intense. But when he kills someone that your character is so attached to, and it's his fucking sister, man, it really makes it a much more... It makes him a much more frightening villain and someone that you really worry about. Blackout has made it super personal and he knows who our character is. See, a lot of people kind of think it's stupid having a uh, secret identity or it's become this cliche. And now in Marvel movies, they kind of make fun of the whole secret identity thing. But when you see results like this and you see what the consequences can be, and how deadly and dangerous they can be. That makes it all the more frightening, and that makes it all the more important and serious. Um, and that's what I really, really love about this issue. Not only that, this this issue hits pretty close to home for me. I mean, no, I didn't have some crazed maniac serial killer some kill someone I love, but uh, I myself have lost a loved one and a sibling. Um, I lost my older brother, and what really hits close to home for me is how Dan treated what could have been his last moments with his loved one. He kept pushing it out. He kept pushing it off and, you know, um, stalling and, uh, you know, he kept getting distracted by other things. There are so many times he had the opportunity to go visit her and instead he decided to, he decided to do something else or, I mean, yeah, the whole Scarecrow thing was important, but even before Scarecrow got out, um, or he there, there was news reports about Scarecrow, there's time in between each of these issues. He could have seen her several times, but as his mom and Barbara stated, Dan avoided her. Dan avoided seeing her. And I myself, um, my brother was on leave several times from, he was in the military, and he'd be on leave and go to Nebraska, which is only three hours away, um, to visit our family. And I could have gone down to see him several times. Like, I had work, and I that would that would be my excuse. My excuse is like, I have work, or, you know, I have all this shit going on. When really, I could have easily um, gone like a Friday night after work and come back Sunday night. I just, I made excuses. And it went, and it... Um, it's one of those things you just regret for the rest of your life that like, yeah, I, I, I made a lot of bullshit excuses and that's how I, I really relate to this as Dan lost his oldest sibling and someone he was super close to. And it was because of, you know, making, ex I, I mean, he could have went and saw her and had those extra moments with her before she passed is my point. And I, I resonate with that. There's that regret. Um, plus in his circumstance, he had Ghost Rider. He could have went with, um, if he would have just went with Stacy when Stacy asked, he probably could have prevented this. I know that's fucked up to say, but, um, he could have. Anyways, uh, this issue was stellar. It was fantastic. It was, in my opinion, this is the issue that really holds your, uh, cements your interest in this run, or it doesn't. If this doesn't do it for you, then... I don't think anything will for Ghost Rider. Okay, maybe some Johnny Blaze stuff. But I really think this is the issue that really cemented um, my love for this run. And this uh, hopefully will do the same for you, maybe. All right, that's it for this issue. Um, 
I think next time we're going to go back in time into some Johnny Blaze stuff. So uh, I'll see you next time.